Hi. Uh, sorry, I got caught up talking in the hallways. There are some very interesting people here. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, so, I think, um, you know how they say that uh, from each talk you should take one thing away? I think with Navjot's talk, uh, it kind of relates a little bit to my business model, which is that I get paid by the hour. So for a lot of the time, you'll see me just sitting back in a chair, you know, with my eyes closed. And I keep telling my managers or my clients, I hope none of them are here in the audience today. I see only a couple. <laughs> I, no, I'm questioning things, you know. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right then. I'm questioning, right? So um, it's funny because it kind of flows into this talk as well. Um, as a designer, you present something to a client. You say, okay, you know, this is what I've been working on for 65 hours, you know, at X amount per hour, just in case they forget. Um, and they look at it, and it's, there's barely anything there. It doesn't look like there's very much work which has gone into it. People will often say, is that, just, is that all you've done? Because design is not really putting things on uh, a product. It's often, design is often done when you can't remove anything further. And I think that's perhaps part of what you're going to talk about. Um, looking at how to reduce unnecessary elements. How do you reduce the experience to its most pure form? And that's what I understand Sovic is going to talk about. So Sovic, there's a number of things. One of which is that he runs a very interesting food blog called Bellycentric. Um, he's also one half of a web design company in New Delhi called Miranj. Uh, and we'd like to thank you for sponsoring the travel. Uh, yeah, and so Sovik is here today, and we've got another speaker, Pratik, who's the other half of Miranj, who's going to talk tomorrow. Last announcement, uh, there are t-shirts which you can pick up outside, uh, Meta Refresh Conference t-shirts which you can pick up outside. Oh, also, I made a mistake about your badges. You should only leave them behind if you don't plan to come back tomorrow. You should hang on to them if you plan to come to the party this evening. So hang on to them because you'll need them to get into the party. Right? Thanks. Hello? Am I, or <coughs> Am I audible? All right. Uh, good afternoon. I am 15 minutes before afternoon, so, but I think I can say good afternoon right now. And Ben and Navjot have like, set the stage on fire, and I'm facing the heat right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. So thanks for the introduction, Rahul. And uh, thanks, Hasgeek, and the entire team for having this conference. Uh, I, I have, this is my second Hasgeek conference, and, and it has improved tremendously from, the last, from last time. And uh, I think it will get better over time. So my talk, it's titled Overexposed. Uh, I guess you guys would have seen uh, my preview video. Uh, I run a web design firm in New Delhi called Miranj. And as Rahul said, we are a small firm, just two people. And I'm sure you can guess which one is me. I am the fatter one. I, oh, this happens again. Oops. All right. All right, so I'm the fatter one out there. Uh, and Rahul pointed out, I, I love food. I talk, I, I go out for food trips. Uh, uh, that, that's something I'm really passionate about. So I'm going to get that in. I start with a small story. My mom is a good cook. Uh, and uh, how many of you guys <coughs> recognize this dish? Biryani, yes. It's a rice dish, very flavorful. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, and my mom served me some biryani, and I was having that uh, uh, tender meat, uh, flavorful rice. Everything was going excellent, and suddenly I bit into something that was a bit hard. And an awkward taste filled my mouth. Like, it was just overwhelming. It was bad, and I, I just spit that thing out. Turned out to be a clove. Uh, how many of you like the taste of clove in your mouth? There are, there are going to be some people who like, how many don't like it? Oops. How many of you have experienced such a thing before? Maybe with chilies, maybe with cardamom, uh, some other spice. So it's that, that bit, uh, that, that small second 
of that bad taste and it just ruins the experience. I complained to my mom, uh, of course, why shouldn't I? I told my mom, mom, you should not put these things in the biryani. And she gets back to me, watch out when you're eating. That's like, that's like your fault. I'm like, okay, and if I, if I say anything more, she'll say, go cook your own biryani. No, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I'll just uh, eat. So from here, I'll just come a bit into the designers. Uh, the genius of design uh, talks about what designers do. And I really like this definition. It says, they worry about stuff, not in general, but in particular. The fine detail of stuff, the stuff that we build our lives from, they worry about it so that we don't have to. And we, in this case, is obviously the users, people who are using the system. And, and I think what makes design great is, is the little things. I think that is what makes the design great. And uh, I think there's something wrong there. Uh, whoops. 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 OK, so it's the little things. <coughs> hey, did you notice a difference? Anyone notice a difference right now? Uh, let's, let's do that again. Now do you notice it? That little thing that's there. These are the things that make the difference. That, this is something that makes the design good to great. And, and I think. Uh, some, someone actually solved the problem of uh, spice in a biryani or any food. And uh, uh, how many of you have seen something like this? It's called a spice bag. Uh, small muslin cloth, you put the spices in that, put it in the food. The flavors are all there, but you can remove it before you serve it on the plate. So it's that, that there's someone who put thought and designed something like this, which will solve that little problem. The food still works, though. Huh? The, the goal of the food is to be good, to be flavorful, to be healthy. Uh, all that is taken care of. But this little problem that occurred to me would not happen if people use this. So my talk is primarily on these small hiccups. These are subtle things. They have some impact, but they are never critical. So you can go on with your product. You can go on serving your biryani without removing the spices. right? People will enjoy, oh, wow, excellent food, good food. But that little experience that's there. So we built tools, right? I guess you all will agree. Uh, we, built, we built tools on the web or in the physical world. And every tool has two sides. So you have one side which is doing the work, which is performing the function. The other side is what the user interacts with. So if I take the most basic tool, a hammer, you have the head part, part and you have the handle right there. The head is responsible for banging on the nail. The handle is supposed to give a comfortable experience to the user while he is at his job. right? And it's often that uh, the head part or the part that does the job, which is, uh, it, it is a bit uh, intimidating or frightening. And users would not want to be on that end. They would, because you put your hand in between the hammer and plop, it, uh, you'll hurt yourself. And if I take a look back at computers, which is a tool which is very close to us, all web designers, uh, programmers, uh, uh, early computers, uh, I, I'm going only to 1940s, not before that. Uh, this is the Harvard Mark I. Uh, these are the input, output. Mechanism. So you would put in a punched tape inside for all the input and output. And it will take a huge space, a full room. right? After about 30 years, you got something like this. It was quite a microcomputer then. Uh, you'll have switches. Uh, you'll have switches to give all the input, the LEDs to give you output. Uh, and you have to understand that. Uh, and you have to be an expert in working with this. Then came the PC. Uh, monitors, keyboard, much more comfortable to do that. Do your work, put, give input, take output. Then mouse came in, GUI, laptops. They removed the mouse. You have trackpads now. 
uh, the thing is much more portable. Uh, and finally, right now you have something like this. Not even the trackpad, not even the keyboard. Uh, it will come when you need it. Uh, so if you look at these computers, they've evolved. Right? They've evolved over time. And what is the most striking difference that has happened to them? Uh, anyone would like to share? What is the most striking difference that has happened? Simpler. Sorry? Simpler. Simpler. I, I, I wonder if people will say simpler because I would, the first instant I say, oh, they have become smaller. Right? They, they used to take floor space and now they take uh, only inches. They, they fit in my hand. But I think more importantly, uh, they expose far less complexity uh, to the users. They have hidden away lots of elements that you don't need. And yes, they have become simpler. And when we say it's simpler, uh, the machines are more sophisticated. But when the user is interacting, his experience is much more smoother. That is the part that has become really, really simple for the users. So I'm going to talk about a few. I'll, give, I'll start with. From here, I'll give out a few examples. I don't want to cover the entire landscape of uh, examples that, I'm, uh, uh, that are overexposed, which are the technical implementations. You need to learn them. You need to understand them. You need to be educated, uh, or you need to be rather trained in that field to understand. Uh, and uh, these are little things that we expose in our interface, and it cause, causes a small hiccup. Uh, let me start off with uh, URLs. This is a small thing that I also said in my preview videos. Uh, it's the first point of interaction to your web app or website. And when you're designing URLs, or right from the beginning when URLs were created, uh, they were always meant to be for people, right? To read and to be able to understand exactly which address we are pointing to. Uh, and I, I went to a website called ASL.com. I guess people will be knowing uh, ASL. It's a mobile. Uh, uh, telecom website, and it immediately redirected me to something on ASL.com slash ASL war. And what is ASL war? And if a user comes and says, what, is this a terrorist website? Okay. And I might be able to understand maybe a web archive, okay, but that's really not what you want to expose to the user. And uh, a news website, uh, let me take HindustanTimes.com, uh, uh, probably you can even drop the www. It's redundant these days. You can drop that. But more importantly, you have something. I, I, let me just split it out into different parts. So you have HindustanTimes.com. You know where you are. It's about business news, world economy. Uh, petrol diesel prices may go up this week. Should I just rush out for a can of petrol right now? <laughs> when, when did it happen? So some, somewhere the URL can give out the entire story. but. If you design it well, it can make a lot more meaning for users. And you can probably drop out something that is so syntactic. Uh, this is a BBC uh, news article. And the next few articles, will, uh, next few links that I show, are all pointing to the same news. If you look at this URL, most likely you'll not be able to figure out what the news article is. right? Uh, uh, I'm sure no one has any idea of what this new news article is. You can figure out, OK, World news, world Asia. So you know where it is, but what news is it? So I, I, I take the same news article, or the, at least the same uh, incident covered in the Hindu. Uh, they have put in things like today's paper, National New Delhi, which makes sense. Allahabad stampede toll 36. So now do people understand what news article this is? If I go f in the Hindustan Times case, they are also giving India, Uttar Pradesh, Allahabad, Stampede, Death Toll, Mounts 2, 36, probe ordered as well. That's part of the URL. So you understand a little more about the story. And, oops, yep. Firstpost.com uh, has a much more simpler URL. It goes first post, India. So you know that the news is in India. You have the story. But it still puts in something at the very end. That, that does not make any sense to the users. And I think this is where uh, the New York Times does it very well. I'm not saying this is the best solution. But I think whenever a news happens, there are two things that I want to know. When and where. When did that incident happen and where did it happen? And it answers that if only they wouldn't have that HTML at the end, because that is a 
technical detail, right? That's what language you're using. You don't need to expose that to the user. You're better off hiding that away from the users. So that's the URL part. Let me talk about actions. So when you have buttons and you want people to perform tasks and click and you put, uh, you put a copy on top of that or the, rather a label on top of the button, what will the button do? Uh, I went to the Airtel website. Uh, these are all services I use, I love to use. Uh, but then I, I take a look at the right side, okay. Pay my bills, click here, click here, click here, click here. The button level say click here. I mean, I haven't seen a chair that says sit here. <laughs> I, I, this is brilliant. I mean, uh, so there are two things wrong uh, in this. One, you, it's unnecessary to say that you need to click a button because the button, by definition or by its own look, uh, should have the affordance. And you should immediately understand this is something that is clickable. But what will happen if I click? The other problem over here is using, you're using the word click. People use touch devices. You might tap. And you don't even need to write click or tap because people might still not understand. My mom won't understand that, <laughs> honestly speaking. Uh, similarly, Kotak, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, that is uh, my bank of choice. And I find their websites to be perhaps the best uh, bank, Indian bank website that I have come across. Okay? Uh, and yet, they have click here, securely login. Now, I am not sure. Can I stop for a question? Yeah, please. Uh, to the SL site, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that the click is actually given their audience, which tends to be a lot of older people. The Airtel? click, the air, uh, the, the, the click, click here, click, click here. here buttons, okay, okay, right? all right. Uh, given that their audience tends to be a lot of older people, mm -hmm. my mom knows what a click is, but she looks at a button and she never understands whether I left click, right click, should I, is it a button or is it just text? So the click actually makes things obvious and I don't s really see the issue. All it's right. repetitive, yes, but maybe for their audience it actually is a good All thing. Alright, so when you come to design, right, there are always some compromises here, right? You're working with compromises. If you take a decision, that will be good. If you take some other decision, that will be bad. I, I think it will be a uh, no design is perfect, I do agree, but going forward and if you look at, uh, uh, if, if the design is such that if you look at a button and you can realize that I can perform an action on that, right, and what it has to say is what will happen if I do that uh, touch action or uh, a tap action on that. So it's something like, I want to pay my bill. So if a button says pay my bill, uh, uh, would, uh, would a person not understand that what will happen if I touch that thing? Or will he, you, are you saying that the person will not be able to realize that if I touch on pay my bill, then I'm going to pay my bill? Does that happen? Uh, maybe, maybe not. For that, we'll have to look at the expanse of the users, look at what they're comfortable with, and if we can match up the extremes, then obviously everyone in the middle take care of themselves. So I, I, I believe uh, a better user testing might work if people, old people are really using the website and they really think if click is there, I'm going to click on that. It makes sense. But even if you say click here, it's also confusing. Ten different click here. Which one do you, does he click on? What happens if I click on that? Lots of problems there. So I'll, I'll go on with my examples quickly over here. Uh, uh, so there are also input. Uh, when you're taking input, uh, lots of times uh, they are very strict. You ask the users to give very strict input. Uh, that's because your entire UI is often built at the mercy of your backend. Your backend requires the input to be strict. So I, I, I had to change my Apple ID password once, uh, uh, very recently. I had a very simple password about a, a year or two back. And when I had to change it recently, I, I was I was not happy to see this. I mean, you are giving me a huge list of restrictions and uh, things that I have to follow, checklist, a long checklist to select my password. Uh, there could be better ways of doing things like this. You want the site to be secured, but this is not the only way to make it happen. Because now you are asking the users to really understand wh what is all this, what it not contains multiple identical consecutive characters. My mom will go. Huh? 
Oh, really? <laughs> I, I must go and thank them for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is also a website that is very well done. I mean, I, I use them uh, that a lot. Uh, I, 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 they don't take my phone number very well. I, mean, I, I think it is very natural for people to uh, create blocks of numbers to memorize. So you'll say uh, 9876, and then you'll give a pause, and then go 675321. And if I want to enter the data like this, and if you tell me that it's not a valid phone number, that's a technical thing that you have exposed to the user. And that is not necessary, because it isn't rocket science to extract the actual information or the real data from a reasonable input. It isn't rocket science. So I think these are the things that uh, we should do. Uh, credit card numbers. Uh, so again, they'll not take spaces. And this is far worse, because every credit card has blocks of numbers. So my, when my mom goes on to enter this uh, credit card number, she goes tap, tap, tap. And there's a space. She puts a space. And everything. she does everything. And then it will take uh, enter a 16 or a 20-digit numeric value. So the, some people have tried to solve this in a different way. Uh, they've said that if, if a person pays, presses space, I, I, I'll hack. Uh, I'll put a JavaScript hack, and I'll not let the space appear at all. So you'll go 473 space. OK, the space is not coming. <laughs> right? Because you want to be very strict with what input you're getting. And I think these things, uh, this is bad too. Uh, so this is where they don't allow spaces to come in at all. Error messages. I think we leave out error messages a lot. I, when we are designing, uh, error cases is something that we have to design for. And what message should go out to people, what tone it is in, uh, what is it trying to explain. Those things have to be careful. Uh, I, 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 this is one of the best designs website, in my opinion, in uh, India. Uh, uh, but this is this little thing. Your username is a required field. Uh, is too technical for my uh, taste. Or I think even elder people. Uh, a simple thing that we need your username. Or uh, please provide the username. Your name, please, uh, is something that I would really like to see. These, the tone changing a lot. Uh, my payment failed, and Flipkart reported, you're sorry, your payment has failed because 3D authentication failed. Why are you doing a 3D authentication on my, whatever it might be? Uh, but of course, I, being a, a technically capable, uh, I mean, being a designer myself, I understand what this is, what this exactly means. But this is not meant to go out to the users, I believe. Uh, and apart from all those copy problems, there, there are general things uh, that happen. So Telka redesigned their website recently. Uh, they've put a big banner on the top. We have migrated uh, to this beta version. Uh, to this beta version of our new website, for all archive stories, visit this, uh, a link. Uh, I think a simple thing that uh, we have a new look. If you prefer the old one, we have it too. A very Something that how you'll say to a normal person. And a different point that why does it even need to be there? Does it need to be there? Maybe it does. Maybe it's a conscious decision to put this. But a person has come here to read a news article. Uh, probably something like this is not required. Maybe it is, again, a design decision. Uh, again, coming back to the ASL website, uh, first time you open it, please choose your circle. Uh, anyone has come down to India for the first time? Do you know what circle you belong to? <laughs> you don't? Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I think you should put down your Google Hangout circle or something over here. So, and interestingly, the same website has done it much better, in my opinion, you are in a drop down that says Delhi or any other city. You are in which city, which state? Give a drop down of that. Uh, again, little things. And often there are solutions that take the problem and pass it on to the users. So well. Uh, and this is like, uh, no, everyone hates this website, but what they have recently <laughs> done is. <laughs> so, so you have. Uh, you have to select a gold category of a payment gateway, uh, which has a success rate greater than 80% or something. <laughs> so why can't, uh, why, why, when you're designing, why can't you take a decision for the user? And why does he even have to select from multiple gateways? Because what he really wants to do is pay. I want to pay. You select whichever gateway you want to send me to. Just send there. I'll put it in my credit card details.
<laughs> so you say, I think you're saying if you give your, sorry, can you repeat no, if, if you actually uh, give your email, somebody else's email ID in the registration form, okay. the error message that you get, it will show the actual user ID of the person who has that email ID. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it. <laughs> uh, right. And one more typical problem that I see uh, and one more re service that is going out in India a lot, a uh, tax fi filing. Again, uh, this is uh, something, it, it pinches a bit. Uh, uh, the government has laid down a set of compliances. You have different forms for different kind of people, different kind of income group, uh, different organizations. How do you want to, how you should be filing your taxes? Uh, that's a paper form that they had designed. But on the web, you should be able to take up the advantages that you have on the web. Uh, perhaps n definitely not the case in which you take the paper form and give the exact same form over here online. So uh, section 80C, section 80 triple C, what is it? Section 80, CCD, oh, CCD. <laughs> All these things. So these, these are technical details that the government has laid down. You can make it much more friendlier while you're doing it. Probably have uh, personas. Uh, uh, how will a person who is just drawing salary, how will he file his taxes? And just make it for that flow. Because what you really need is a strict output at the end, what you have to give to the government. You don't have to take the input exactly in the same manner. So what you really need is, uh, I think, empathy uh, and not be complacent about these things. Uh, it is important to step into the user's shoes. Uh, but I don't think it's easy. Uh, the reason it's not easy is because we are too competent. Uh, so there is something known as the stages of competence and it relates to the psych psycho uh, psychological states uh, involved in the process of uh, progressing from incompetence to competence in a skill. So if you're learning a new skill, what are the stages that you pass from? And the first stage is uh, unconscious incompetence. And this is the time when you know very little about how little you know. Make sense? You know very little about how little you know. And once you pass that state, you go into a state of uh, what is called as conscious incompetence, which is when you realize how little you know. You realize that I know very little. right? And when you realize that, you start learning. And when you start learning, you slowly reach a stage of conscious competence. That is when you have to consciously acquire the skill and you have to consciously apply your skills. And beyond that, once you have practiced enough, you become in a state which is unconscious competence, which is where you don't have to consciously think through while applying your skills. If I have to give an example, uh, let's say driving as an example. When you're a little kid, you don't know what is driving. You know very little about what you don't know. Right? You don't know that you don't know how to drive a car. So you think you have to sit in the car and the car will just go. That's what you think as a kid. Uh, slowly you learn that, okay, there's something known as driving. I have to learn how to drive a car. My dad drives a car. My uncle drives a car. Once you are trained in that, the first thing you do is, okay, I'm going to sit in the car. Okay, what is the thing that I have to do? Oh, neutral. Let me check the neutral. Right? Let let me start the car, let me put, the, oh, I have to press the clutch before I, have, I can change the gear. So you think through all the actions that you're doing, and you consciously apply those actions. But years down the line, when you've practiced enough, you sit in the car, you just go zoom, you don't even know what you're doing, you don't know whether you've turned on the car, because it happens automatically. You see a cat coming in front of the car, and you'll press the brake immediately, right? No one thinks that I am going to press the uh, brake when something comes in front of the car. It happens automatically, and that is the stage of unconscious competence. And I think that uh, we, as creators and designers, are, uh, have, are unconsciously competent at what we do. We just know what to do, and we just do it. And we, we just apply our skills straight away. Which is where uh, we are experts at designing, and, but we are also experts as users. And as a result, uh, if we, I, I, I firmly believe that if you don't decide these little things, if you don't explicitly think about these little things, then somewhere down the line, these, dis, these decisions will happen implicitly or unconsciously, and these things will be exposed to the user. Right? So you have to explicitly take a decision that, OK, the URL is something that I have to worry about. When I'm giving an output, this is something I have to worry about. Uh, otherwise, it will happen implicitly, and you'll just give out uh, things that you understand, but your users users won't. And 
uh, I think implementation should follow uh, interface. Uh, many a times clients come to us, oh, we have the entire backend ready, I just want the interface. Whereas I think that it should be the other way around. You have the interface and you drive the uh, backend to uh, make the interface functional. Uh, the interface should not be at the mercy of backend. The backend should be at the mercy of the front end, I guess. Uh, that is how I put it. Uh, and similarly, uh, when you're taking any business decision, you should keep in mind the behavior of the users. Right? You, take, uh, you don't try to bend those behaviors. These are natural tendencies of how people work, how people understand, how afraid they might get if you put in, a, uh, if you put in something that is scary for them. Uh, finally, uh, your users are here on your product to achieve a goal. And they have come over here because they think that your product can help them achieve that goal. Uh, so that is why I think it is extremely important for us to align with the user goals. And uh, I think Frank Chimero put it very well. People ignore design that ignores people. And I think the web is an amazing platform. Uh, it's, it has given us uh, lots of capabilities. and. Uh, Whenever we are designing uh, on the web, uh, which is reaching out to thousands and millions, billions of users, uh, I think at every design step, at every point when we, are, when we have to take a decision, we should ask ourselves this question, am I overexposing these implementation details that should not go out to the users? And uh, I, I just hope that people will take, uh, this will be a principle that you will take along while you're uh, doing your design decisions, you're making your design decisions, and you'll just stick by it. Thank you. So, questions? Uh, so, uh, I like your uh, idea about people, we being experts of uh, as users as well, making uh, some decisions difficult. But uh, in a sense, what, what I would like to ask is, is, uh, is there something called backward compatibility in design? Like take for example, uh, you, you might say Mac has a great design, but coming from the background that I come from, uh, if you give me a Mac, I slightly get confused because it's not natural. My, my natural tendencies have actually changed over the period because of using some technology. So isn't there a, uh, a sort of backward compatibility as well when you're thinking about design? Uh, look, I think uh, when you're taking design decisions, uh, there are certain set principles and certain set goals that you can always fall back to. Because those are the things that will most likely be true. Everything else is an unknown. You don't know what you don't know. So if you have a set of principles and values and you just live by those, uh, things, uh, simple things like how will I show an error message, how will I take input, how will a person naturally go and work with a system. If you just stick by those principles, uh, it, even if it's something that is new to a user, it is more important for the product to be learnable automatically. A person should, become, should be able to pick up a smartphone and start using it rather than someone have to go to a two hour lecture, pay $500, take a training and start using that. So that is where I think you have to draw a balance. And uh, it's not really about backward compatibility right there, but it's, it's not about making all interface looks the same and work the same so that if a person comes from some other, uh, uh, if, if you're using Windows and you come to Mac, then it has to work exactly in the same manner. But the interface has to have these simple qualities that it's learnable very easily. Self, you can easily self-teach yourself. Hi. Here. Uh, where are you? Here. Okay, okay hi. Yeah. In your talk, you stressed on the, the formation of URLs, right? You said okay. that you have to spend little time so that you can put out w what the content you want to in the URL itself. So I do believe that no, we should expose the URLs in a semantic way so that a lot of APIs can access. But it doesn't make any real sense for the user. Like most of the URLs that shared upon the uh, web, it, they'll have the URL shortness. For example, if I want to check any article, either on the Twitter or on the Facebook, everyone uses the short form. So there is no real sense to do it that way, right? Uh, I think uh, that is, 
Uh, I think these sh shortened URLs, in a way, are breaking things over here. Because it was never meant to work like this. It was meant to always link to the right URL. And when you read the URL, you should be able to understand. Because end of the day, URL, uh, you could have done with an IP address instead of putting a domain name, right? It, the reason something like that came in, the reason you are naming a file instead of calling it by its file ID on, the, on your uh, file system, right? is so that people are able to read it. And it is more and more important these days to write your code or design things so that if someone else comes in, like you go away from the system and someone, some other developer comes in, he looks at the URL and is able to make sense about what action will that API perform. So it's about explaining to people rather than just making it work for the system. That's what you're targeting for the developers, but not the end users, right? No, so in case you are doing an API URL that is targeting to the developers. Yeah, I mean, actually, you will make sure that it's either in the semantic way or it follows the rest architecture. So, so you don't have to lose, so it's not give and take. You don't have to lose on semantics to make it uh, friendly for a user. I, I don't think that you, if you want to go semantics, it becomes unfriendly for a user. Got it. Thanks. Uh, one uh, quick announcement before we continue with the questions. Uh, we'll, if you'd like to take a break, could you do it now? We'll continue with the questions for another t five or six minutes, uh, but let's start the next talk sharp at 12.30. So if you come back by 12.30, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, can I continue with my question? Savik. Oh. Yeah, hi. Yeah, uh, hi, Savik. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, I'm glad that there is someone who, uh, no, who discussed error messages. Because in India, people don't uh, take content seriously. Sorry? Yeah. So as I said, in India, people don't take content seriously. Right. So do you think it's time like uh, the design teams uh, should hire a copywriter uh, if their budget permits uh, okay. and, uh, you know, uh, focus on micro copies? Because most of the time, they don't even, uh, you know, uh, give much importance to micro copies, uh, which creates a lot of confusion and, uh, you know, and makes the experience complex. Uh, I think. We are already past time when we should have a copywriter. Uh, copywriter is really important. And uh, if, if you look at most of these examples, it's a problem with the copy. Right? Uh, and uh, as designers ourselves, we, even we feel that there's a limitation. There's something that is holding us back from writing and expressing ourselves exactly in the way in which people will understand it, uh, which is where I think uh, copywriters uh, are extremely, extremely important. The faster you can have them, and uh, we tend to design our websites and our, the, the work that we do our, for our clients, we do it content out. So we, we take the content first before we start designing. Uh, we try to take uh, make error messages before we decide where the error message goes in, and things like that. Uh, so copywriter, yes, very uh, important, and of course, what you're saying is right. Uh, I have a question about the URLs uh, that you mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So when you're designing URLs, there are two things that uh, you need to work on. One is uh, making the URL readable okay. and uh, making the URL permanent. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, many of the things that you considered, uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the parts are uh, not uh, important. You can uh, uh, remove them. Okay. For example, it has article dash 1234.html or something. Okay. So uh, if you see some of these URLs, that ID number is actually very useful to make the URL permanent. For example, some of the techniques that are used are uh, you add an ID to the URL so that uh, if you find a uh, typo in the uh, message or the part of the URL, you can fix that so that uh, it gets redirected to the right page. So I guess uh, uh, sometimes uh, even though some parts are not uh, really adding a value to the readability, might actually uh, so make you're a value. You're saying, uh, if I'm right, you're saying that that's a necessary evil. Yeah. Uh, so I think when you're designing URLs, uh, these two are the absolute goals. It should be readable and they should be permanent. No questions about that. Uh, but how do you go on to achieve these goals uh, can make a difference. So as an example, uh, there is always a reasonable decision which will most likely work for all cases. For example, these news articles, if they have put the date component, it not only makes sense to the users, but it could in a way also make it permanent because most likely there will not be two articles on a news site or a newspaper on the same date at the same place happening, right? 
which is where it can remain permanent as well, human readable as well, and it works. Now that's a design decision. Do you want to insert this number or whatever your internal ID is or not? Uh, there are pros and cons. There are things that can happen better if you put a number. There are things that are, can happen better if you don't put a number. But I would uh, first lean towards making it work for a user rather than uh, making it uh, easier for developers to handle these edge cases. No, I'm not talking about edge cases. The thing is, uh, sometimes there's a need for changing the URL because uh, you find a mistake in the typo uh, in the thing that I've put in, etc. Okay. Right. So, uh, so, so you're losing the. So, if you're, if you're, if there's a need for change in the URL, anyways, they are not permanent, right? You've broken the first law. No, but uh, if you have an ID, then uh, it's very easy to redirect back. You can redirect back, yes, for sure, but it's still not permanent, right? You're, and if you right. want to redirect yeah. back, you can still redirect back a typo. I agree. So you're saying that's a leaking of the technology. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yeah. Should I take these offline or yes. should I? Yes, we have five minutes to the next one. Hello. Uh, 